Good evening, Tuesday night, through the Bible, in the book of Revelation. It's good to be back. Took a little break last week. We uh, were doing some uh, housekeeping things as far as the sound and the worship ministry was concerned, so we were able to get some things accomplished. But uh, back in the saddle, excited to be here tonight. Um, when we uh, left the book of Revelation, we were ending up in chapter 6, and we saw that there had been six seals that had been broken, and that when the last seal had been broken, that... The kings of the earth, the rich, the slave, the free, all hid themselves in caves among the rocks of the mountains, and they called to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of wrath of their wrath has come, and who can stand? And we said, we can stand, because we're the redeemed. And we will be standing, we will be around the throne of grace, and we will be hanging out with Jesus, and we'll be seeing incredible So tonight we're going to be in Revelation chapter 7. This is a controversial chapter only because of this 144,000 that is described in this chapter. There are those who claim to be the 144,000. There are those who claim that the church is the 144,000. So we're going to discuss tonight who the 144,000 is. And we are going to come to a conclusion that it's not what a lot of people think. So... Join me in prayer before we get started. Father, thank you for this evening, Lord, and we thank you for your word. I pray, God, that you would enlighten us, that you would take us deeper, Lord, into a deeper understanding of your will and who you are and what the future holds. Father, thank you that you love us enough to tell us about the future, to warn us about the future, and Lord, to put an urgency in our hearts to share with people the future and what the future looks like without Jesus in their lives. Pray for those who are hurting tonight, Lord, who are in need. Specifically, I pray for our brother Greg tonight, Lord, and just ask God that you would just meet him in his room tonight where he's at, God. That you would just minister to his heart. That you would physically heal him, Lord, the great physician at work. So, Father, thank you for what you're going to do in all of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, and all the church said, Amen. Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. It reads, After this I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on the earth or sea or against any tree. So we see these four angels. Now we're not sure who these four angels are. There is no description of them. But these angels have one mission. And that mission is to not allow the four winds to blow on the earth. It says here that the winds are not to blow on the earth or the sea or against any tree. In other words, the wind is going to be completely still, silent. Nothing is going to happen. Now, the four corners, what does this mean? Well, the four corners are referencing almost like the four points on a compass. A compass has four points. It's got four corners. Each angel is in charge of a direction of the wind. Now think about this. It says, "Do not." It says, "Holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow." But the wind is going to blow, and we're going to see this later on. And these winds are going to cause a destructive force like we've never seen. Can you imagine? Like right now, the wind is blowing from a certain direction. I think it's blowing from the north today. Right? Is that what is this? Is a northerly wind? Okay, but can you imagine if the wind was blowing from every single direction at the same time? Can you imagine what was going to happen? What is going to happen? Well, that's what's going to happen. The four winds, the winds are going to be unleashed upon the earth. They're going to come from every different direction. You think tornadoes are bad and hurricanes are bad? This is going to be bad when these four angels allow the winds to go. Now, verse 2 reads, Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the earth and the sea. So these angels have the power to harm the earth and the sea. He's saying, Do not harm the earth or sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So we see this other angel, and he's coming from the rising of the sun. Now, some translations say from the east, which is the direction the sun rises from. And it says here that he has the seal of God. Now, what is the seal of God? 
Well, in the past, I have shared how a king would have a seal or a signet, and he would have it as a, as a ring or, or as maybe a necklace with a stamp. And this stamp would be used to, to, to be put on the side of merchandise or on anything that was the king's and, and, and uh, bring him validity that this was him or his signature. And so the seal of the living God, I believe it's the Holy Spirit that's going to be poured out on the 144,000 Jews during the tribulation. Remember what Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14 said? We read this a few weeks back. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So we see here that in this passage of Scripture that we are sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. God puts his seal on us. Every one of us has the seal of God on us, and it's the Holy Spirit that is the seal. And then it says that the seal is going to be on their foreheads. Now, why on the foreheads? This is interesting. Now, some of you may know that the, that the rabbis and the priests, they used to wear these boxes. They'd put a, have a headband with a box on their head, and then they would have a wristband with a box on their, on their wrists. Okay? Inside these boxes would be scriptures. Okay? And so the thought here is that, the, is that God's spirit, God's voice, God's word would be at the forefront of their minds at all times. And so here we see that the mark that is going to be given is, is a mark on the forehead. Now, Ezekiel gives us some insight into this. If you go to Ezekiel chapter 9, starting in verse 1, it reads, Then he cried in my ears with a loud voice, saying, Bring near the executioners of the city, each with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold... Six men came from the, dir the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his weapon for slaughter in his hand. And with them was a man clothed in linen, with a writing case at his waist. And they stood in, and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of the God of is the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub on which it rested, to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed in linen, who had a writing case at his waist. And the Lord said to him, Pass through the city, through Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations that are committed in it. And to the others he said in my hearing, Pass through the city after him and strike. Your eyes shall not spare, and you shall show no pity. Kill old men outright, young men and maidens, little children and women, but touch, but touch no one on whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the house. Then he said to them, Defile the house and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. So they went out and struck in the city. And while they were striking, and I was left alone, I fell upon my face and cried, Ah, Lord God. Will you destroy all, destroy all the remnant of Israel in the outpouring of your wrath in Jerusalem? So this is a picture. This is a picture of what is going to transpire during the tribulation period. Now, it's a picture. This actually did happen in Ezekiel's time, but this is also a dual prophecy. This is going to happen again. Now, these six men in this scripture, they are not literally men, but they are actually angels, okay? And so they're sent out for God's judgment, much like the angels that we see in the book of Revelation. The four angels that are holding back the winds right now, those are four angels that are going to be used for God's judgment upon the earth. And it says that God's glory is removed from the presence of the people. This is exactly what's going to happen when the church is raptured off of the earth. God's glory and presence is going to be gone. Now, the Holy Spirit will still be active 
and be activated during the tribulation period, but it's going to be in a different way than what we see today inside the church. Now, the mark is to be placed on the foreheads of those who truly belong to God, much like we're going to see in the book of Revelation here in chapter 7. There's going to be a mark that's going to be placed on them. Now, it says here in the scripture with Ezekiel that one clothed in linen with a writing case. Now, linen is always associated as a priestly garment. Because of this, some think this is a theophany of Jesus. But we have to be careful with this. There's no real indication that this is Jesus in the flesh or a theophany of Jesus here in Ezekiel. Could be, but we want to be careful with that. Now, a scribe would always carry this type of case, this writing case, so he'd be ready to write down whatever was needed, or a scribe would be used to put the insignia on for a king, that stamp. All right? And so the writer was told to put a mark on the foreheads. Well, what's the significance of this mark? Well, it's like the blood on the doorposts of the Israelites' houses on the night of Passover, or the scarlet cord in Rahab's window that allowed, that showed that she was not to be touched when Joshua and them went in to strike Jericho. It's a sign of hope. It's a sign of hope that this mark, these people that are going to be marked, it's a sign of hope, and it's a sign of God's power and authority in their lives. Now, Revelation chapter 7, 3 later describes God's God's servants again being sealed on their foreheads, and we're going to see this in a minute, okay? But Revelation 13, 16 and several other uh, passages of Scripture also describe a satanic counterfeit of this mark, identifying allegiance to Satan and his false messiah. Remember, Satan is a counterfeit, and he's always looking to to appear like Christ, enough to take us away from the truth, enough to take us away from who Jesus is. Church, we have to be so careful that we're not being subdued by Satan and his deception. We get deceived all the time. We fall under false doctrine or false par- prophets or, or, or false pastors or, or whatever is fake. Satan is a counterfeit, and he is going to produce a counterfeit mark that is going to be counterfeit of what God is doing here and what God has done in the past. We've got to be on guard. 18th century pastor Adam Clark said this, This is an allusion to the ancient everywhere used custom of setting marks on servants and slaves to distinguish them from others. It was also common for the worshipers of particular idols to have their idols mark upon their foreheads or arms or etc. We have to be careful. We cannot be deceived. Now, there is some debate whether the seal will be visible or not. We don't know. It says that this, this mark is going to be put on the forehead. But is it, is it a, a spiritual seal? Is it something that spiritually happens? If the Holy Spirit is, is the seal that we see in Ephesians, I don't have a mark on my forehead, right? But I have a mark on my heart, right? So we don't know. Okay? We can't be 100% sure exactly what this mark will look like, but whatever the seal is and how it looks and works, it will be known to all. All will know it. I don't know how that's going to work, but all are going to know that this mark exists. And then it says, do not harm. So these angels cannot do anything. They cannot do anything that they've been called to do as far as the winds are concerned until this seal is placed upon, right, those who God is going to call, these servants of God. So who are these servants of God? Well, let's go to chapter or verse 4. And I heard the number of the sealed were 144,000, sealed from every tribe, Of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed. 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben. 12,000 from the tribe of Gad. 
12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, excuse me, Joseph, and 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. So we see here this 144,000 is sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Now, there has been some major debate who this 144,000 are. The Jehovah Witnesses have famously said that this is them. Where are the 144,000? Well, something interesting happened. When they got to 145,000, something was wrong. So then they changed it and said, well, it's, it is still us, but it's a select group of 144,000. Isn't that how we are? Isn't that how we are as, as human beings? We're going to have our select group, right? Well, you're in, but you're not here. You're, you're, not, you're not part of the in crowd. That's, that's not you, right? Well, listen, Jehovah Witnesses are wrong, okay? There are those who teach that this is the church, that the church, right, has replaced Israel, the replacement theology that's out there. But we know that right now on this earth today, there's probably close to 2 billion Christians. So that makes no sense either. This is why I teach that we take Scripture literally until we can't. You have to take Scripture literally. It doesn't say here these were like the sons of of Israel, or these could have been the sons, or had the appearance of the sons, it says that they were from the tribe of the sons of Israel. It's very clear. We can't spiritualize things that don't need to be spiritualized. God is not sitting there going, okay, I'm going to make this as crazy as I can so you can really be messed up and not really know what I'm talking about. You know, it's not what he's doing. It's not what he's doing. Here's the thing. This group comes from the tribes of Israel. Ethnically, they are Jewish. And they are 144,000 chosen ones. Now, if you notice something, if you go back and look at the list of tribes in your Bible or tablet, there's a tribe that's missing, and it's the tribe of Dan. Dan is left out. Now, some think this is because Dan is the tribe of the Antichrist based on Daniel chapter 11.37 and Jeremiah 8.16. Daniel 11.37 says, He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other god, for he shall magnify magnify himself above all. And Jeremiah 8.16 says, The snorting of their horses is heard from Dan. At the sound of the neighing of their stallions, the whole land quakes. They come and devour the land and all that it fills, the city and those who dwell in it. Now, again, this may or may not be the case, but without doubt, Dan was the tribe that introduced idolatry to the nation of Israel. And we see this in Genesis chapter 49, 17 and Judges 18, 30. And therefore, some scholars believe the Antichrist will rise up from the tribe of Dan because of their adulterous nature. And this is why Dan is not in this description of the 144,000 from the 12 tribes. But here's something interesting, and I never saw this before. Although they're left out here, they are the first tribe mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 48 in the millennial period. They're the first ones. Dan is the first one listed. So Dan is going to have a special place during the millennium. Now, I don't know what that's going to look like, but this is, listen, isn't this how God is? He never forgets us. We might be chastised. We we might have to go through some, some tribulation or trouble, but he never forgets us, man. God never forgets us. He didn't forget the Dan, he didn't forget the tribe of Dan. They're just not going to participate in this very important moment, but he's got something for them later. Now, this list is also interesting in the way that the tribe of 
Ephraim is referred to, but only in an indirect way. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, the tribe of Joseph is what's mentioned, right? But Joseph was represented by two tribes. He was represented by Ephraim and Manasseh. Since the tribe of Manasseh is mentioned here already, right? By elimination, the tribe of Joseph must mean the tribe of Ephraim, who is listed, but not by name. So I don't know why God has chosen to, to write things the way he's written, but he has. Here's the thing, is that God's word is God's word. And God's word is not trying to be, he's not trying to twist his word. And again, like I said, he's not trying to make his word confusing. But there's a reason why he lists it the way he does. Now, I'm going to tell you why I think that he did. And this is strictly a D opinion. Okay, I'm not saying it's a fact. But there's something that's written in the book of Hosea. If you go to Hosea chapter 4, verse 17, I didn't give you guys this. It says, Ephraim is joined to idols, leave him alone. See, Ephraim got into idolatry heavily as one of the tribes. And he writes here in Hosea, leave him alone. And I think that's why Ephraim was left off of this list, and it was called Joseph instead. Again, just saying that's kind of my thinking, but I don't know. Kind of weird that it says leave him alone. Now, some people claim that this list must be purely symbolic because it's an irregular list. But what is regular in the Bible, right? What is regular? Over 20 times the tribes are mentioned and listed, and they are done in different order, including Dan being left out in 1 Chronicles chapter 4. So because they're listed differently or in different ways, it doesn't take away from the legitimacy of the list. It doesn't take away from it. See, people are always trying to find a reason why they can't believe the Bible. You know, why does Luke say this and why does John say this? Well, why does, uh, you know, Tony say that the car accident happened this way and Gordon said it happened this way? Two different perspectives. Same accident, same thing. There's no difference. It was their view. We've got to be careful when we're talking about the Word of God. So who are the 144,000? Well, most Bible scholars either regard the 144,000 as the church or as converted Jews who are still identified as Israelites in some manner. Now, this is an important issue you cannot ignore, church. This is important. If this is the church then the church is going through the great tribulation, but they are sealed for survival. But I have a problem with this. And this is where we must look at facts in Scripture and see what lines up. So here we go. In Revelation chapter 7 and 14, we see, we see clear descriptions of this group. In Revelation chapter 4, they are called the children of Israel. Okay? Or the sons of Israel. The church is not referred to in this manner anywhere in the New Testament. The tribal affiliation is specific. Revelation chapter 7, verses 4 through 8. We saw that, the 12,000 from each tribe. The church is never referred to in any tribal affiliation. Show me. They seem to be protected and triumphant through the period of God's wrath. Meeting Jesus on Mount Zion at his return. We see this in Revelation chapter 14, 1. They are called to be celibate. They're not to be in any type of sexual sin or immorality or anything. They are the beginning of a great harvest here on earth. They will be without fault and full of truth. We see that in Revelation chapter 14, 5. So listen, looking at these facts in Scripture, it's hard to say that this is the church. And here are a few things that truly identify this as Israel. Israel is a term never specifically applied to the church in the New Testament and never by any Christian until A.D. 160. 
There's nothing here that shows this tribal affiliation is symbolic. Some say, well, it's a symbolic thing. It's just a symbolic thing. There's nothing. It's, it's literal. It says what it is. Also, it says that, um, that they're going to be sealed, right? That they're going to be protected. Well, I find it hard to believe that the church going through the tribulation would go through it without there being any martyrs. I don't believe that would happen. Why? Because the church, the Christians would be marked. We would be, they would come after us. Also, being celibate. The church was never required to stay celibate. Paul didn't tell us to not marry. Paul didn't tell us to stay celibate. But these Jews, and we're going to read this when we get to chapter 14, they're told to be celibate. The 144,000 are Jews who belong to Jesus and are protectively sealed through the tribulation. That's who this group is. Joseph Seiss, a 19th century theologian, said this, They are not part of the church proper, for their repentance comes too late for that. They are a super addition to the church, a supplementary body, near and precious to Christ, but made up after the proper church has finished its course. These Jews are going to be incredible. I think they're going to be incredibly gifted. They are going to be part of a harvest that is going to come upon this earth that's going to be absolutely amazing. We know that there's going to be a ton of people that are going to come through the tribulation period and be saved. I think more are going to come through the tribulation period than any other time in history. Strictly my thought, but I do believe that. Verse 9, after this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all the tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Wow! What a powerful scene that John is seeing. Now, it says here that he sees this great multitude. This gathering was so big, it could not be numbered by John. That's how many folks are going to be in heaven, man. That's a whole lot of folks. When we get to, in, in, into, the, into the end of Revelation and we start describing the new Jerusalem, you're going to be amazed at how big it really is. Unbelievable how big it is. But something else that you want to see here in this scripture is here we see the diversity of heaven. As we have diversity here on earth, so it will be in eternity, right? There's diversity here on earth. John could see this and how this multitude clearly represented all on earth. Charles Spurgeon, and I've got a lot of Spurgeon quotes tonight because I think he really locked down chapter 7 very well. He says, I suppose as he looked at them, he could tell where they came from. There is individuality in heaven. Depend upon it. Every seed will have its own body. There will sit, there will sit down in heaven not three unknown patriarchs, but Abraham, you will know him. Isaac, you will know him. And Jacob, you will know him. There will be in heaven not a company of persons, all struck off alike so that you cannot tell who is, but they will be out, out of every nation and kindred and people and tongue. You will be known as who you are in heaven. Who you are, you will be known. We're not all going to look the same. You remember that movie Star Wars when they cloned all them people and they looked all the same? They're like millions of little star troopers, storm trooper guys, whatever they were, and they all look the same, right? That's not what's going to happen in heaven. We are all going to look like we look, I'm going to know that you're such and such, and you're such and such. You're going to know that I'm me. We're going to be able to identify each other. It says, clothed in white with palm branches. This reminds us of the promise for those who are, who are overcomers, getting their white robes. And the palm branches, what do they remind you of? We just talked about it on Sunday, right? Of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Maybe palm, Remember, palm branches were about victory. My boy Spurgeon again says this, palm branches were emblems of victory. It shows this great multitude celebrates a great victory. 
The palm, the ensign of triumph, indicates most certainly a conflict and a conquest. As on earth, palm would not be given if not won. We may conclude that the Lord would not have distributed the prize unless there had been a preceding warfare and victory. From the very fact that the glorified carried palms, we may infer that they did not come from the beds of sloth, or gardens of pleasure, or palaces of peace, but they endured hardness and were men trained of war. That's who we are, man. We are warriors. We are warriors. We're to have a warrior spirit. We fight on our knees. We fight against the principalities and the things of darkness. But we fight on our knees. That's how we win. We fight through. We persevere. We stand for the name of Jesus. That's who we're called to be. And when we get there, man, I'm going to get my palm. I'm swinging my bad boy. I'm going to like, yeah, get my palm on, you know. It also says salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This great multitude does one thing here, one thing, and it cries out. It cries out to the goodness and greatness of God. They give honor and praise to God for salvation through the Lamb, Christ Jesus. God is the source for salvation. God is the source of our salvation. But Jesus is the source which salvation comes from. Right? It's the plan. His death and resurrection sealed this. And because of this, this multitude comes and they're like, thank you for the victory, Jesus. Thank you that you've resurrected me from the dead. Thank you for the promise of resurrection. We're going to talk about that on Sunday. Man, why wouldn't we be praising God? Right? Here's the thing. And take this to heart. Because I had to when the Lord showed me this. As believers on earth, I think we tend to take our, our salvation for granted. We take it for granted. We don't praise God like we should. We don't worship God like we should. We're not sitting there singing to the glory of God for what he's done in our lives. We, we, we complain to God about what he's not doing in our lives. And, and we don't, do you really thank God for salvation every single day of your life? Do you really say, thank you, Jesus, I'm saved? I don't. I don't thank him every day for my salvation. I'm too consumed by stuff, by the affairs of life, by the things and the ministry that are going on. And I forget to thank God for salvation, but those in heaven, they don't forget. It's not so in heaven. Here, it is at the forefront of their hearts, minds, and mouths. We are to praise God with our mouths. That's a command. Verse 11 says, And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Oh, boy, that's going to be powerful. Now, the same group we saw in chapter 4, we see again the elders and the four living creatures fall on their faces along with the angels. So as the multitude sings, as this multitude of, of, this, of, of every race and creed and ethnicity, every tribe, every nation, as they're singing and praising God for salvation and for the Lamb, it compels everybody else to begin singing, to begin praising I like what David Gusick said. He says, as these other created beings hear the worship the great multitude brings to God, they see more clearly the power and wisdom and majesty of God. Do you understand that? Do you understand that when we truly worship? Like, I'm going to tell you something, man. There was a couple that was visiting us last Sunday, and man, they had the gift of worship. They were rocking it. They were just, they were just worshiping. Let me tell you what that did. That brought everything up. It, it made me want to worship more. 
I'm like, well, dog, man, they're getting it on. Let me get my hands up. Our worship has a way of bringing others up, compelling them to want to come along with us and worship God. That's why we stand up here on Sundays and bring out our instruments and multi-tracks and everything else so we can worship the Lord because we want to compel you to do the same thing. But you know what you guys do? You come in here and you don't want to worship God. And I'm just being straight. You don't want to worship him. Man, I can be in with a choir. I can be in with the most clanky guitar playing guy. Worse than me, and I don't play good. Right? And I can still worship. I'm not coming for the entertainment. I'm coming for him. I just want to sing to Jesus. Our hearts are wrong when it comes to worship. And I'm telling you right now, yeah, this is a rebuke. Get your heart right. You're called to worship the king. What you have in heaven, what did Jesus say when he said, the the disciples said, teach us how to pray, right? On earth as it is in heaven. As it is in heaven, it should be on earth. That's how it should be. We are the body of Christ. When we come together, man, we should be so fired up to be together and loving Jesus, man. We should want to sing at the top of our lungs, man. What a beautiful picture in heaven of God in all of his glory with his creation, man. What a beautiful picture. And we should, we should reflect that. We should reflect that, church. Verse 13 says, Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So one of the elders asks a question, right? He says, who are these clothed in white robes? And where have have they come from? Why does he ask this question? Well, I think it's because he senses John is asking this question in his brain, in his heart, in his vision. And he says this to prompt him. Listen, if you're an elder or a leader, sometimes you have to have the ability to get people to ask questions. I love doing it. Go to a, go to a small group with me. I will mess you up because I will ask the, the craziest questions just to get you engaged. Well, this guy asks a question of John. Well, who are these? To get John going in the direction he needed to go. So John... He's pretty slick with his answer. Well, sir, you know. (laughs) You you know who it is, right? I'm not sure, but you know. (laughs) And so the elder tells him, this is who it is. It's those clothed in white. The ones that have come through the great tribulation. Listen, church, the presence of so many tribulation saints is a testament to God's power and to his glory and his mercy. See, a lot of people teach that when the church is taken out of here, it's over. Everybody on earth is is doomed. It's not true. If you really read the book of Revelation, how do you explain what we see in the book? These are people, these are going, these are people that are going to become believers during the tribulation. And even during great judgment and tribulation, many will come to the saving knowledge of Christ. That's the bottom line. They're going to come to Christ. And because the great multitude are mentioned right after this 144,000 here in Revelation chapter 7, many think they are, and at least in part, due to the work of those 144,000 saints of God. I believe these are directly a result of that. Perhaps 144,000 are evangelists to help reap the huge harvest for the kingdom during the Great Tribulation. They are. (laughs) That's their job. That's why they're there. It says they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. These saints are still saved the same way as everyone else. Right? It's through the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. All come to Jesus the same way. Right? It's not their martyrdom that saves them. 
Because you're a martyr, that doesn't get you to heaven. What gets you to heaven is because you have been saved and washed in the blood of the Lamb. You are saved by the blood of Jesus. That's what gets you to heaven. It ain't nothing else. It's all Jesus. My boy Spurgeon, once again, I'm sorry, but he just nailed this one. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Not one of them became white through his tears of repentance. Did you hear that? It's not your tears of repentance. Not one through the shedding of the blood of bulls or of goats. They all wanted a vicarious sacrifice. And for none of them was any sacrifice effectual except the death of Jesus Christ the Lord. They washed their robes. Now, no, excuse me. They washed their robes now where but in the blood of the Lamb. It was in the blood of the Lamb. It wasn't any way else. And it's odd to think of something being turned white by the blood. Like if you get blood on your clothes, I mean, it stains it. It looks, it's ugly, right? You know, especially if you're wearing a white shirt or something and you get blood on it, it's over. But the blood of Jesus cleanses us. His blood does something that is, it's not natural what Jesus' blood does. His blood does the supernatural. Remember what Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 says. It says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. It's the blood of Jesus that makes us white as snow, man. That's what purifies us. That's what, that's what makes us become like wool. It says, therefore, they are before the throne of God, verse 15, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So here's the thing. There are no waiting lists in heaven. You don't have to get your name on the list and wait. You're there. You are there. You're in the presence of God. When you die, you're in the presence of God. There's no purgatory. There's none of that going on. When you die, Paul says, absent from the body is present with the Lord. I die, I'm with Jesus. I die, I'm with Jesus, right? God and his redeemed, they're together day and night. That's what this verse says. They're with him all the time. We're going to be with him all the time. Can you imagine? Man, I can't even imagine that. Being with Jesus all the time, how does that work? Being with God all the time, God, what? I, I can't even fathom that. It says he is their shelter. God's presence will provide all that is needed. Just his very presence will provide all that we need. He will protect us, right? He will provide. It says they will not hunger or thirst, right? We don't have to ever worry about being hungry. Like right now, I'm hungry. I'm, I'm, I'm like, man, D, get over with so you can eat, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Hurry up. <laughs> come on, D, let's go. <laughs> That's what my stomach's saying, <laughs> No harm will come to us. No harm will come to us. We will never have to live in fear of being harmed because we're in the presence of God. It says the lamb, Jesus Christ, will be their shepherd. He will care for them as a shepherd does his sheep. Another Spurgeon quote. Jesus does shepherd us now. And he is close to us and cares for us now. Yes, but in heaven, it will be so much more. The true Christian life, when we live near to God, is the rough draft of the life full of communion above. We have seen the artist make with his pencil or with his charcoal a bare outline of his picture. It is nothing more, but still, one could guess what the finished picture will be from the sketches before you. God has given us a glimpse. He's given us a glimpse of what it's going to be like, man. 
Have you ever thought about those times when the Lord just ministered to your heart in a way like you just, you just needed it so bad, and he watered you, and he, he poured into you what you needed for that moment, and you're just like, thank you, Jesus. I feel so close to you. That's a picture of what it's going to be like in heaven, but it's going to even be better. Full communion with God. Oh, man, that's going to be a trip. Ooh, it blows my mind. It says he's going to wipe away tears. Listen, in heaven, we will know no sorrow. Pain will be gone. Grief will be no more. The hurt and struggle of this earthly life will be no more, and tears will be a thing of the past. Can you imagine your tears being a thing of the past? There's things that I know people still weep about 50 years later because they're so real and so painful. Can you imagine being in a position to where you never have that feeling again? To where those tears are in the past. They don't even exist anymore. Some wonder, how can there be no sorrow in heaven if we have relatives or loved ones who perish in hell? Won't we be sorry for them? Well, my boy Spurgeon had a, has an answer to that question. Now, how is this? If you tell me, I shall be glad, for I cannot tell you. I do not believe that there will be one atom less of tenderness, that there will be one fraction less of amiability and love and sympathy. I actually believe there will be more. But that, but that will be in some way so refined and purified. See, we think in our earthly mindset right now. But when we get to heaven, our thinking and everything about us will be refined and purified. We will think like God. We will sense like God, right? He says, but they will be in some way so refined and purified that while compassion for suffering is there, there'll still be compassion. Detestation of sin shall be there to balance it. We will hate sin so much. It will bother us like God, like it bothers God, that although we'll have that compassion, on the other side, we will detest sin so much. He says, and a state of complete equilibrium shall be attained. We'll be, it'll be equal for us. He says, perfect acquiescence in the divine will is probably the secret of it. But it is not my business to guess. I do not know what handkerchief the Lord will use. But I know that he will wipe away all tears away from their faces and from my faces and the tears among them. I don't know how God's going to do it. I don't know how God's going to do it. There are people that I have lost in my life that unless they had a radical encounter with Jesus on their deathbed, they are not in heaven. And that, that bugs me. I got to be honest, it bugs me. I was thinking, when I was thinking about this message today, I was thinking about a, a, a guy that was like a dad to me. I loved this man. He was like a dad to me. And he got cancer. He loved my son. He would let them go shooting and stuff. He used to take us out on the boat. He just loved me. I mean, he was like the closest thing to a dad I ever had. And he got cancer. And I got busy. And the Lord kept telling me, you got to go see him. you got to go see him. you got to go see him. And I'd be like, okay, God, I'm going to go see him. I'm going to go see him. And then one day I get a phone call from his son at work telling me, Mandy, my dad's gone. He was gone. I sat in my, at my desk at work, and I cried for 10 or 15 minutes brokenhearted that he was gone, but even more brokenhearted because I didn't make sure he knew Jesus. Because I don't think he did. And when I stand before the Lord, I know God's going to hold me accountable for that one. I know he's going to say, Mandy, I told you a million times to go and you didn't do it. I was disobedient. And I know that if he's not there, it was his choice. And, and I know that, that, that I'm, I'm not going to be brokenhearted like I am now over it. 
but I feel like God uses it as a catalyst today for me to be about his business and sharing the love of Christ. I'm telling you tonight, church, there's no worse feeling than knowing you blew it. There's no worse feeling than knowing I should have stepped out in faith. Whether that person hated my guts after I got done, it was more important for me to have them hate me than live in hell forever and ever and ever. See, we really care too much about ourselves, man. And we don't care enough about Jesus. We have the message of Jesus in our hearts, the life-giving message of Jesus in our hearts, and we are wasting the life-giving message because we don't want to take the time to be uncomfortable. We don't want to take the time to share Christ. But yet, you have in your heart And I have in my heart what the world needs and why in the world. They don't need COVID-19 vaccine. They need Jesus. That's what they need. COVID-19 is not going to save you. You are still going to die someday. So because you got a COVID-19 vaccine, that doesn't keep you safe. You're still going to die. Church, when are we going to get the urgency in our hearts and start caring more about Jesus and others than ourselves? I was thoroughly convicted over this message today because there are people that are not going to be in the multitude there because of my negligence, and I live with that every day. Please. I have to. Let's remember that God will wipe away our tears, but we are still going to be held accountable for what we do. Father, thank you for this evening, and thank you for your word And I pray, Lord, that we would take what you've shown us tonight, God, and that, Lord, that we'd have an urgency in our hearts, Father. You have called us to fill heaven. Yes, Lord, it's your spirit that seals. It's your spirit that draws. But you use us, God, to be your mouthpiece and your feet and your hands, Lord, to deliver the message of salvation. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can understand your word and not be deceived by you your word, Lord, that we can see it clearly and understand it, and that as others are teaching false things, Lord, we can read it with clarity and say, nope, that's not what it says. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to do this. Thank you, Lord. Prepare us for this week, Lord, as we celebrate the Super Bowl. Man, the Super Bowl is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, man, and that is the biggest thing that's ever happened in, in history in all the universe, Lord, and I'm excited about what you're showing me for Sunday, God. And uh, Father, I just love you so much, and I'm so thankful for your grace and your goodness in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name.